So I've been doing this playthrough of Alpha Sapphire over on TikTok where I'm only allowed to use frog Pokemon. It's been fun, I've had some great moments, and the response has been incredible. This video is not really about that, this is just an easy way for me to plug this at the beginning of the video. Go check out my TikTok. And on every single episode since the very first one, I've gotten the same questions over and over again. What game is this? How did you randomize it? How can I play this for myself? So I'm here to give you a quick and dirty tutorial on how to do these things. People also keep asking me how Kiram is a frog, but honestly, that's a question for a different video. Just trust. Okay, so I want to jump right in, but I want to set some expectations up front. In this video, I will show you where to find and sort of how to set up the Citra emulator. I will show you where to find and how to use the randomization software. I will not be showing you where to find a ROM of your favorite Pokemon game. That part's going to be in you, and honestly, it's not that hard to find ROMs. I'm just like 99% sure that it would be illegal for me to directly link you to a ROM. Google is your friend. I do want to add a disclaimer that some of the websites that host ROMs are sketchy, so do your due diligence when you're researching where to get your ROMs from. Please don't download anything without kind of vetting it first. And honestly scan everything you download with a virus protection software. This is the part of the video where before I actually get into the tutorial I ask you to subscribe if you're new here and also leave a like if this helped you or you enjoyed this and just check out some of my other content and I have a secondary channel where I post competitive Pokemon content that will be linked in the description down below as well. Okay let's get into this. Okay that out of the way I'm gonna break this video down into pieces there should be timestamps in the description taking you to the different parts but we are going to start with downloading installing and sort of setting up Citra. So for the first part of the video we're gonna be covering Citra I'm not going to re-download and reinstall Citra. I already have it downloaded and installed. The process is very simple, but I would like to say that this homepage is a great resource for information if you ever have any problems with the Citra software. Come here first. So from the Citra homepage, you're gonna click download here. It will take you to this page where you can actually download the software and it should auto detect what platform it needs to download for. You will download, install it. There are two builds of Citra. I haven't had a problem using either of them. The nightly build is sort of the official build of Citra that is tested and reviewed. The canary build of Citra just has additional features that have not been tested yet. But it is worth noting if you're experiencing bugs and crashing, sometimes just switching over to the nightly build will solve that. Okay, so once you've downloaded and installed Citra, running the software will look like this. Again, I already have games, so if I drop down on my Citra game folder here, you can see the games that I have installed right now. You're gonna have to find your own ROMs. Whenever you find a ROM, the way that I get it on this home screen is if I right click the Citra game folder and I say open directory location, you can just drag and drop the file in here to have it on this home screen area. It's also worth noting that it will tell you how compatible the game you're trying to play with Citra is over here. Great means that the game is pretty much flawless. Okay means you can play the game from start to finish. I've never played a game that had a compatibility score less than okay, but I can attest that the Pokemon Ultra Moon games work just fine. So for the purpose of this tutorial, I'll be showing you all my settings and how to tweak things around within the Alpha Sapphire file that I use for my Only Frogs playthrough. I'm just going to click the game, start it up. This is what it looks like whenever a game loads inside Citra. Uh, it shouldn't take too long. The game will load. The audio kicks in, uh, everything's great. You can tell from this cutscene already that things look fantastic, uh, but this is where some people start to have issues. Citra is great, uh, but at least to my understanding, it's also relatively demanding. If you don't have the nicest PC in the world, you might not be able to run things on the same settings as me, but I will show you, I, I guess, like the settings I'm using, you can see if they work for you, and if not, there are easy ways to drop down the quality and still play it like a better quality than you would be playing on your 3DS. So starting off, all the configuring I'm gonna show you is gonna happen from this emulation tab. You click configure, uh, and then you get this menu that pops up and gives you basically all the options you need. This is where if your game is crashing, if it is laggy, you will come in here and you will tweak things around and hopefully it will work better for you. On the general tab right here, I've never touched web, debug, or UI. I've never done anything to that. Uh, I don't think I've really ever changed anything except the emulation down here. I have the speed set to 110%, so the game plays 10% faster than it normally would and this is you can set an alternate speed there's a hot key I think I have mine set to control Z so the game will go from 110% to 820% it's great it's like the speed up button if you've ever used a different emulator for Pokemon it just lets you play the game quicker and get through things faster um, in system I don't believe I've ever changed any of this either at all I, I don't yeah I've never changed the system camera or storage I've never messed with it I'm guessing you can maybe set up a webcam with this I, I have no clue um, graphics this is the big one here um, so these are the settings I'm using feel free to pause the video and look and try and emulate this before you move on so the graphics tab is where Citra really works its magic and it starts off right here at the renderer um, the internal re resolution so the native resolution of a 3ds is 400 by 240 like 400 pixels by 240. Um, I play at 9x, which is nine times the native resolution, so 3600 by 2160. That's why the game looks like this, 
it looks crisp, clear, clean. Whereas if I go back and I configure and I change it to the native resolution, it's going to look like this. Um, it's gonna look bad. It's gonna look like I've just scaled up a 3DS game. The lines aren't crisp anymore. There's a lot of pixelation. You see a lot of that like, I, I don't know, like it, it looks like I scaled up a 3DS game. I don't know how else to say that. I play on 9X mostly because I didn't know 10X was a thing. Because if you look at this menu normally, you have to scroll down to find 10X. So I play at 9X and I think it looks great. I have enable linear filtering turned on and then I don't use a post-process shader. I don't use a texture filter. I have custom textures turned on. I have uploaded a custom texture pack, which is not necessary at all. It just makes like little icons like the Pokemon typings or items in your bag look more crisp. I'll show you a little bit later how to import custom textures. So the graphics tab is going to be the biggest bottleneck for people. If you start trying with my exact settings here, you might have to turn the resolution down. If your computer cannot run Citra at the 9X, start by turning it down and figure out what your computer can handle. Now over in the advanced tab, I have these first five boxes selected. Um, hardware render and hardware shader uses your graphics card if I'm not hardware render and hardware shader, hardware render and hardware shader, Hardware renderer and hardware shader uses your GPU. The hardware renderer and shader use your GPU to take the load. Hardware, the hardware renderer and shader use your GPU. To, if the hardware renderer and shader, if you have a decent GPU, can increase the performance of Citra. Um, accurate multiplication, just make sure that things are rendered more crisply, if I'm not incorrect. Um, it can decrease performance, so if you're having performance issues, this is one that you can uncheck. And then this one, enable shader JIT, just increases overall performance. You can hover over all of these and they will tell you what they do. And then I have use disk shader cache selected as well. Um, the place I would start if you were copying all these settings and your game is laggy or it's not running smoothly, just come to the resolution tab and lower it down and see if you can find a resolution that the game runs smoothly for you. As far as the audio tab goes, there's not a lot here. These are the settings I use. Feel free to copy this. Um, the volume is really the only thing I ever tweak. I turn it up and down based on if I want to hear the audio or not. And I've never used a microphone, so I just don't mess with that. The control tab is how you control the game. If you don't have like a Bluetooth controller of any type or some sort of external device, uh, you can just set things up to be your keyboard and that would be great. I use a GameCube controller plug into this really old universal USB connector that can connect PS2 controllers, GameCube controllers, and old Xbox One controllers. It's old, I got it when I was in high school, but it still works, and I like using GameCube controllers, so that's what I use. The setup process is pretty painless though. It will tell you what button you're trying to put an input for, so if I click A, and then I click A on my controller, it goes to button zero. You do that for the entire controller. The only thing I've found is that down here on the circle pad, you can either click set analog stick if you have a controller with an analog stick, or you can just treat it like, I guess, a D-pad of sorts. The only weird thing I've noticed about setting up a controller, and this could just be my controller, it could be the adapter I'm using, it could be a lot of things, is that when I set up my circle pad like standard, like I said, if you click the button and then just put it in the direction, then I can walk around like normal and it works, you know, it works fine, but I can't just like tilt the stick a little bit to kind of like creep around like you can in Alpha Sapphire. But now if I go back to the control pad and I click set analog stick, and then it says after doing this, just move your stick horizontally. And then I move this dead zone around I can now only creep around, uh, which is kind of weird. I don't know why. I don't know why it's that way. I, I'm sure maybe someone could tell me that if you're well versed with Citra. That's just something I've noticed. Also under controls in the hotkey tab, you can set up hotkeys. The only one I've ever used is toggle alternate speed. It's just the default is control Z. So you'll see that in the base game, uh, the speed is normal. If I hit control Z, suddenly the speed goes to where I, I, can, I can zip around. As for the screen layout, this is the one I choose to use, but you can change the layout really simply by just coming over here side by side is the other one that I've seen really commonly where you have the bottom screen roughly the same size as your top screen it's also worth noting that if you're playing a game where you need to interact with the bottom screen a lot uh, your mouse just clicks on this as if it was your stylus so if I go and click on all these icons that's how you click on the bottom screen I'm not going to show you how to do it in this tutorial because I've never done it but it's worth noting and it's also really dope that games have multiplayer connectivity so Pokemon for instance if you wanted to do sort of like an online Wi-Fi battle uh, you can do that through Citra I don't know how. If you want to do that, just find a different video that shows you how to set that up. I just think it's a dope thing. The last few things I want to cover, if you're used to playing on an emulator, then you understand save states and low states. If not, um, let me explain them real quick.
real quick. Save states are basically, you can create a save state whenever you want. It will date the save state for you. And then you can reload that state very quickly. So for instance, if I wanted to create a save state right here, I could save it into slot nine. And then if I move forward a little bit or whatever, and then, oh, oh no, I need to go back to that save state. Uh, I can go and load state slot nine, um, which just takes me back to that save state. It's just a neat feature. It's how you can create save states. And the final thing I want to cover is the lack of a black outline that my Pokemon and character model have. Um, I will put a side by side up on screen. The way I've accomplished removing this black outline is just a cheat I found online. So to input cheats, if you go to emulation cheats, um, my no outline cheat here. It's just this simple code. I will put that in the description down below as well. This code works for, I think, Alpha Sapphire and Omega Ruby. If not, I will put a differentiator there. But each game is going to require a separate code to remove the black outline from your character. If you like the outline, you can leave it. I just think it makes it look a little bit more smooth without it. And since I mentioned custom textures, let me show you really quickly how to add them in. If you right click on sort of whatever game you want to add them to and you say open custom texture location, um, this is where you will just copy and paste all your files. This one for Alpha Sapphire is really organized by what all the textures and like icons are. The one I have for Ultra Moon it is just all of the images sort of placed in here. So you just see all of these custom textures. I think either way works. Um, I will leave a link to the Alpha Sapphire custom texture thread I found on Reddit, or I guess it was Omega Ruby Alpha Sapphire. I'll leave a link to that in the description down below. You just download the custom texture pack, extract it, and then drag and drop it into the custom texture folder. It's super easy. Okay, so that was Citra. That's how I have my Citra set up. That's how the games I'm playing on Citra look so crisp and clean. Now we're going to talk about actually randomizing a Pokemon game. This is essentially the same software if you've ever used the Pokemon randomizer for gens one through five. Um, that's all it used to be able to randomize. Now it works on six and seven. So you can do the 3DS games as well, which is really dope. Uh, so you're gonna come, this will be linked in the description down below as well. The Universal Pokemon Randomizer ZX version 4.1.0. I think this is the most recent version. If it is not, please someone tell me and I will update the link in the description. Um, but you're gonna come down here all the way to the bottom and you're just gonna download this zip. Once you've downloaded and extracted the folder, these should be the files inside of it. Um, you're really only ever going to click on the launch dot jar you double click on it it will launch the randomizer software for you and then this is where sort of the magic happens if you've ever used the universal randomizer software before this is just an upgraded version of that so i'm going to go find a rom i'm going to import it and i'm going to show you what all you can tweak okay so starting down here in pokemon base stats i normally don't touch this because i think it can make the game a little bit erratic but if you click random your pokemon will have randomly generated base stat total so you can end up with a caterpie that has an insane attack stat and hits really hard for example um if you click shuffle it just kind of moves around what stats the pokemon already has and changes like where they go so you could have a chancy that instead of having a really fat hp stat has a really fast speed stat for example it just moves them around standardized xp curves pokemon level up at different speeds you can standardize legendaries or strong legendaries to have a, a faster xp curve so they will level up quicker um, pokemon types this is another thing that i don't often change but some people really really love it um, you can have pokemon Pokemon types be unchanged. You can have them random and follow evolution. So if your Caterpie is randomized to a fire steel type, when it evolves into a Metapod, it will probably still be a fire steel type, or you can have random completely. So if you have a grass type Psyduck, it could evolve into a dragon type Golduck. Um, Pokemon abilities, you can click random, and then there are all of these sort of uh, modifiers for that. So you can ban trapping abilities. You can make it to where the random abilities follow evolutions. You can allow Wonder Guard, which means you could catch Pokemon or potentially get gift Pokemon with Wonder Guard. Uh, you can combine duplicate abilities, which just means like abilities that are effectively the same thing get combined for the sake of having more variety. You can have abilities follow Mega Evolutions and you can ban um, trapping abilities, negative abilities, and bad abilities. So negative abilities being things like Slack Off or what is it? Not Slack Off, Truant. Or you can ban bad abilities like Plus Minus. Down here in Pokemon Evolutions, you can have it unchanged or you can have it to where Pokemon evolve to different Pokemon randomly. And then you have all these modifiers where you can get same typing, similar strength, limit evolution to three stages, force change, um, and then allow alternate forms. If you hover over any of these, it will event, like it will bring up a description that tells you what selecting this box does. Um, I like to change impossible.
possible evolutions, so things like trade evolutions become possible. Um, you can do make evolutions easier. This means that if a Pokemon would evolve to its final evolution, like Hydreigon evolves at like level 64 or 79 or something stupid, you can make it to where it evolves sooner, um, and you can remove time-based evolutions. The next tab is starter, statics, and trades. So basically you can randomize your starter Pokemon. You can pick custom starter Pokemon to put here. Um, they can be random completely. You can do random starters with like two evolutions so that it always feels like you're still getting a starter Pokemon. Um, static Pokemon, you can randomize and you can make it to where legendary swap for legendaries and standard swap for standards. I think it's what a lot of people do. And then in-game trades, you can randomize uh, the given Pokemon, so the Pokemon you would get out of the trade, or you can randomize both the requested and the given Pokemon. On this tab, I think the most popular options are completely random starters, static Pokemon, swap legendaries, and swap standards so that it's legendary for legendary, standard for standard. Because if you do random completely, you could encounter a Mewtwo at the end of the game that is a Caterpie, which would be kind of depressing. And then on in-game trades, uh, I feel like a lot of people just randomize both requested and given because all of the Pokemon you're encountering are going to be random anyways, so you might as well randomize the requested Pokemon. It's worth noting that this percent level modifier lets you change the level of static Pokemon you would encounter. So if you are encountering something that is level 60 and you increase it by 50%, it should theoretically be level 90 instead. It lets you make things harder or easier depending on what you want. In the move and moveset tab, you can make the game incredibly chaotic because you can randomize everything about moves. So you can randomize their type, their accuracy, their power, so on and so forth. Down here, you can make it to where the move sets are unchanged, or you can say random, preferring same type, which means if you have a water type, you're more likely to learn water type moves. Random completely is you'll learn whatever. Metronome only mode just means your Pokemon only learn metronome. If you select to randomize the move sets, you can come over here and add modifiers. You can make it to where Pokemon have four moves at level one instead of just a guaranteed one move. You can reorder their damaging moves. You can say no game breaking moves, so moves that are just really, really strong and make the game bust it early like dragon rage and you can force a percent of good damaging moves so if you want every move your pokemon learns to be a good damaging move you can say 100 percent and then you can say evolution moves for all pokemon which means whenever they evolve they learn a new move in the faux pokemon tab you can make the game incredibly hard most people opt to just randomize completely all of the other trainer pokemon and then you get all of these modifiers um, you can randomize trainers names their classes you can make it to where your rival actually carries their starter throughout the game which i think is kind of neat so if your rival gets a really busted starter they'll carry it through the entire game. Um, you can try to use Pokemon of similar strength, which means they will try to swap Pokemon that the trainer would normally have for ones of similar strength. Don't use legendaries, no early wonder guard. So no early wonder guard just means as soon as Pokemon get, I think over level 20 or 30, what does it say right here? Yeah, level 20, um, wonder guard can start appearing, but it doesn't appear before that. So you don't just lose automatically. Um, allowing alternate forms would allow you to encounter trainers with just like mega evolve Pokemon. Um, swap mega evolvables means that if you are fighting a, like a champion that has a Pokemon that can mega evolve, it'll swap which Pokemon so it can still mega evolve. Um, random shiny trainer Pokemon just lets trainers have shinies and then you can change the percent level again so you can do like a 50% level boost which means trainers Pokemon will be 50% stronger and you can force fully evolve Pokemon at a set level I think most people do like 40 or 45 when they're doing this so once you start fighting trainers with level 40 and 45s they no longer have you know Caterpies and the like and then down here on the totem Pokemon this one's only for gen 7 you can make the totem Pokemon random the Pokemon you get is an ally random the aura is completely random and then you can also randomize the held items, allow alternate forms, percentage level modifiers, same as everything else. This entire tab lets you make the game as challenging or as easy as you would like. In the wild Pokemon tab, this randomizes all the encounters throughout the game. Um, random completely is a little chaotic. It means each area will have a ton of randomized Pokemon. Area one-to-one -one mapping is what I normally do. So if there are six encounters you can get in an area, then there are going to be six randomized Pokemon in that area. Um, global one-to-one -one mapping is if you would find a Caterpie on Route 1, but you would also find a Caterpie on Route 20 those will always be the same Pokemon. I think a lot of people don't like that because you want more variety when you're playing through. Um, I normally do area one-to-one -one mapping. Similar strength is lame because in route one, you can't catch legendaries if you have similar strength turned on. Catch them all mode means that all the Pokemon will be dispersed somewhere throughout the world. And then type theme areas just means that a route could be all fire or a route could be all dragon or what have you. And then over here as always, you have the modifiers. Time-based encounters means that for whatever area you're in, if the game has like a day night cycle, in it if it's nighttime it will be completely different encounters than it would be in the day or the morning time so you can do that to add even more variety to your routes um, don't use legendaries just means legendaries won't show up in the wild which is lame I wouldn't click this um, set a minimum catch rate makes it to where if you want 
a better chance at catching something that has a really high catch rate. You can set it, you know, lower or higher depending on what you want. Randomizing held items means that Pokemon will randomly hold held items and you can ban bad items so they will only hold things that are at least reasonably useful. Um, the percentage level modifier is same as all the others. You can make it to where Pokemon in the wild are stronger. And then allowing alternate forms means you can run into things like Mega Evolutions in the wild. The TMs, HMs, and Tutors tab is exactly what you think. This is where you can randomize all the TMs. You can keep the field move TM, so things like uh, Rock Smash when it's not an HM, you can make sure that you can still get that TM to progress through the game when needed. You can force a good percentage of damaging, damaging moves, so you can say if I want 50% really good damaging moves and then 50% of whatever else the game wants to give me, you can set it to that. TM compatibility can be unchanged, which means whatever the TM is, like for instance if the TM is Bullet Seed, right, then only Pokemon that can learn Bullet Seed would be able to learn that TM. You can randomize it to prefer the same type, uh, which means that if the TM that you are receiving is a similar type, then your Pokemon that you can click prefer same type, which means that if a Pokemon has the same type as the TM, it will have a higher chance of learning it. Randomize completely just means compatibility is chaotic and completely randomizing things makes the game really, really hard sometimes. Uh, full compatibility means everything can learn everything. And then TM level up moves sanity just means if a Pokemon can learn a move by level up, it can learn it through a TM too. The move tutor section is exactly the same. It's just move tutors instead of TMs. Onto the item tab, you can shuffle items, which just means all the items on the map will still be on the map, just in different locations. You can randomize them completely, or you can randomize them with even distribution. Even distribution just means you won't find the same item over and over again. So if you click random, you can also click ban bad items. So things like mail, uh, you won't find. You'll find items that are, again, at least somewhat useful. As for special shops or places where you buy items that aren't just the standard marked guy, um, you can either shuffle them and make it to where the items, again, are all the same items that would normally be available but dispersed differently, or you can randomize them completely, and when you do, you can ban bad items. So again, getting rid of things like mail, just items that have no use. Uh, you can ban regular shop items. So from a special shop, you wouldn't be able to buy like a Pokeball, for example. Uh, you can ban overpowered items, items that might be seen as really, really broken. Um, you can balance the prices, which is, I think, uh, suggested to click because sometimes shop items will be aggressively expensive if you do not. You can guarantee evolution items, things like stones or the held items that evolve Pokemon, and you can guarantee X items, which are just, you know, X attack, defend, etc. And on the final tab for Miss Miscellaneous tweaks, you can get the fastest text, which just makes the text move faster than it does normally. This can cause graphical issues, so just be warned that if you click this, sometimes the text boxes will just disappear completely and be empty. Uh, you can ban the lucky egg. The lucky egg is just seen as like kind of broken and it makes leveling up really easy, so you can ban that if you want. Um, you can make it to where all wild Pokemon can call allies. Obviously, this only works in Gen 7. And finally, you can select don't revert temporary alternate forms, which means if you catch a wild mega absolute soul and you don't have this selected whenever you save the game close it and reopen it that absol will be just a normal absol but if you click don't revert then for the rest of the game that absol will be a mega absol so a lot of people click don't revert that way they get to keep the megas and alternate forms that they catch in the wild okay so we've gone through all the tabs and now we're going to create our randomized rom so you're going to click randomize save and then you get two options here a layered fs is basically like creating a patch for the game i think this is the much quicker option option. Um, I always just create a CXI. It creates a larger file. It takes a little bit longer, but it's a file that itself is randomized and you don't have to layer the patch on top of just a normal version of the game. If you feel like you need more information on this, just click this link and it will take you to a page that better explains this. Okay, so my game is randomized and the last few options you get are one, whether or not you want a log. A log just shows you everything that was changed inside the game. So it will show you what starters were randomized, what all the items are, etc. It's just all of the information. Um, I don't want one here. I'm not worried about it. And then the other thing is you can get a seed. So if you want to produce a seed file so that someone else can play the exact same randomized ROM as you, uh, then you can produce the seed and then they can load the seed on their end and randomize their game the exact same way that you did. All right, let's test our randomized ROM out. I'm going to go ahead and load the file. I just saved it to my desktop for ease of access here. All right, so we're about to see if our starters are randomized. Something that I want to point out before we actually get to that, that is kind of unique to, I believe, at least the Gen 7 games is you can kind of notice a little bit of ghosting around the sprites. That's just a 
consequence of them being upscaled to a high definition. Fed ghosting exists in the native resolution of the game. It's just a lot harder to see and it's used to create sort of a parallax effect or like depth of field. You cannot get rid of that. Trust me, I spent several days trying. Okay, our starters are randomized to Togekiss, Gloom, and Excelgore. I'm gonna take the Togekiss. This Togekiss is a ghost fairy type with Steel Wing, Icicle Crash, Brave Bird, and Frenzy Plant. So our randomization worked. Let's see what the first random encounter is. The first thing we run into here is an Excelgore. So yeah, the randomizer worked. Okay, that's it. That's everything. Hopefully this tutorial has answered your questions about how to play the Gen 6 and 7 games in HD, and hopefully you understand how to randomize the games. Now, once again, all relevant links will be in the description down below. If something is missing, please leave a comment on the video letting me know and I will try to update it. Once again, subscribe if you're new here. It would help out the channel a ton. Like this video if it was informative or helped you or you just enjoyed it. Also, go ahead and leave a comment in the comment section down below letting me know what games you plan on randomizing and uh, don't forget about my secondary competitive Pokemon channel. I would like to get that to a thousand subs by the summer. I really hope this is everything. I feel like I'm missing something, but I can't think of it. My name is Vivid. I'm kind of done here and I have to leave. Okay.